Hey there, fight fans. Andy Cotterell here with Charles Jourdain, who is fighting in two weekends at UFC 297 in Toronto against Sean Woodson. Charles, thank you so much for speaking with us. Thank you for having me. It, uh, you've been in the, the, the MMA pool for a long time, and uh, we didn't have the, a bit, uh, the, the chance to talk that much, and here we are, so I'm happy. Yeah, well, that's good. I'm super happy, too. It's uh, You and your brother are both are very difficult to get a hold of for interviews. Uh, oftentimes, I'd, <laughs> I'd, ask, uh, I'd ask one of your coaches, Fabio Holland, I'd, I'd ask him, hey, I've known Fabio for 20 years. I said, hey, Fabio, can I talk mm -hmm. to uh, Charles or Louis later? And he goes, oh, yeah, yeah, for sure, we're going to do it. And then I go, hey, hey, Fabio, where's the, where are the guys? Like, oh, they've already gone. Yeah. So it's good. We got you anyway. It's all good. So you're sitting there in your, in your Here car. We are. You're sitting there in your car in, in Brassard on a beautiful sunny day, and you've got your sunglasses on. And I mentioned to you, it's not just a fashion statement. So why are you wearing those glasses right now? Uh, because I just came out of the clinic because of the medical we are, uh, that are necessary to get a, a Toronto license for, for the, the, the bout. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and they inject you with drops that like make your eyes a little bit numb. So unfortunately, I can barely see right now. So it's a good yeah. time uh, to sit down and talk. So, but anything visual, I'm I'm very blurry right now. Okay, good. Well, I'm sure you'll be fine soon. You know, that's one thing. When I was around when mixed martial arts first became legalized in Canada, and at the time, one of the the main arguments that the opponents of MMA had was that it's brutal and it's barbaric and it's dangerous. When in reality Maybe more so, well, of course, more so now than back then, but it's a very safe sport to compare to some others. I mean, even just the medical requirements for you as a fighter, I mean, I'm not going to ask you to go through them all, but they're quite extensive, aren't they? Absolutely. And it's uh, it's very uh, expensive as well to get a license. And uh, I, get, I tip my hats off to uh, any companies that are supporting young up, up and coming fighters. As you guys know, like I think my first fight purse was like 500 bucks, and just my uh, scan for the brain was 750. So without sponsors, mm -hmm. uh, I will. I, uh, I it would have been very hard for me to fight. So I highly encourage uh, any company to encourage these young athletes. Anything, 200 dollar, 100 dollar, anything can help. I've been in those shoes. No, I'm not in those shoes anymore, but, you know, I, I, I've run with them for a long time. So, yeah, very expensive to get, get a proper license. But uh, it's it's uh, necessary in order to make our sport more, uh, uh, less eligible to, uh, less susceptible, let's say, to have a brain injury like we had in boxing recently. Mm. We had a young man, Yvon Michel, because she didn't have proper medicals and uh, she also has this tendency to bring all those mechanisms to get uh, to get the, 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 the record of his fighters to get boosted. Yeah. And unfortunately, a lady that is uh, necessary in order to make uh, uh, the, the, the athletes, the, just to make sure the athletes are protected. Yeah, 100%, for sure. I, you know, when I go into my planning stages for an interview for somebody like you, you have a lot of media coming at you over the years. And I find uh, as a fan, I don't like watching interviews where you get asked the same questions over and over. How are you? How is your training? How are you feeling? What's your weight? How's the weight cut? Uh, how do you think the fight's going to go? So I'm going to move a little bit differently than, than that in this interview. I'm more curious to know right now. So it is... What is it, Wednesday, the week before the fight? So we are Thursday, Friday, so eight days away or 10 days away from the fight. I'm just sort of curious, can you take us through, you know, your your thoughts and your emotions leading up to fight night? Like some fight, and what I mean by that is some fighters focus on their opponent the whole time. Like you, you've got Sean Woodson. So some fighters that are thinking about him all the time. Some fighters are more introspective, like they... It's, it's, a, it's a battle within yourself, right? Like you're just worrying about yourself every minute of every day. As you're leading up to the fight, what are you thinking about throughout the course of your day? Are you thinking about anything or are you just, because you've been doing this for so long, you're just going through the motions? Um, this is a proper point. I've been doing this uh, for a long time. Mm -hmm. Even though I'm 28, I think it's going to be my 13th bout uh, with the UFC, which is the biggest promotion in the world. So... So now I have more, fight, more fights in the UFC than anywhere else. So 
this is a, a big thing that helped me uh, get my mind ready for, for this uh, specific fight. There's also the aspect that it's going to be the first one I ever do in Canada for UFC, so Toronto, which is uh, absolutely amazing, but will bring a lot of... Uh, a lot of pressure which I need to deal with but I cannot project myself too much I just need to focus on every day like this Wednesday is as important as fight day wait wait in day any day so in order to not get crushed by the pressure it's very important that you take it one step at a time if we are we're having a conversation and that is uh, more important than pushing myself far away with my thoughts because those thoughts can be uh, good but they can be destructive as well and uh, it's my duty to control them and uh, live the moment more than think about the moment so yeah I'm more on the second side like I I, <clears throat> I prefer to to take this day the, the the best way I can and not project myself too much it's funny you said that because when I did my New Year's Eve article a few weeks ago, I, I, I got your answer, but I also got your coach Fabio Holanda's and that was his answer. He says his New Year, his 2024 goal is to just wake up every day and have the best day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yesterday I talked to him and uh, normally Tuesdays are very intense for him because he has to teach class at 12, come back, his boys come back from school, now he has to go teach uh, mm -hmm kids class then adult class all the kids are tired from school not going to jitsu and it's a big day for him and i said oh it's the big day he said no it's the best day he's like his mentality is is it's fun to see people who have uh, of a certain already with with already great life experience still trying to better themselves and still yeah. trying to to see the positive and everything and i'm i'm very grateful to have a master who's uh, not only great as a, at his sport, but great in life as well, and always seeks to challenge himself to get better. So, it's 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 important to surround yourself with people who are not complainers. And yeah. Fabio is no way near that. You're absolutely right. That the the positive mental mindset is so crucial because there's so much real adversity in the world that you can't afford to allow an internal adversity to creep into the rest of it too. Right. Absolutely. And and when you look at what's going on around the world also makes you think that your little selfish, yeah. selfish uh, way of thinking that your life is horrible because you lost a fight. I think you, you should go around and see what the world really is. And uh, yeah. that's what I'm, I'm very grateful that the UFC and even privately to have traveled the world a lot. And even though you lose or you win, shouldn't affect that much. Uh, your 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 mental state because mm -hmm. if you win you're not the king of the world you were just the center of attention for a very yeah. brief moment and what defines you is is how you can stay centered even though you won because now you know i uh, if i win in toronto it's going to be great canadian fans everything but i need to not let that get to my head and be like oh i'm the king of the you're not the king of anything you yeah what you are is not a victory in the sport what you are is how you carry yourself and this is more important than just uh showing off and be like oh i'm i'm the top of this i'm the top of that no you're what you are is the interaction you have with people and uh to to be the most self-centered individual is uh, a higher goal for me than to be a mm -hmm. vedette let's say <laughs> When I hear you speak like this, it, it makes me think of one of my favorite topics when speaking with fighters, and that is the mental mindset. Uh, years and years and years ago now, it was, I think, first George St. Pierre came out, and he's the one who revealed that he was seeing a sports psychologist named Brian Kane. And if you're familiar with the story, uh, after George lost to Matt Sarah, Brian Kane uh, suggested George get a brick and carry this bag around his bag with him all the time, and that brick represented the loss to Matt Sarah. And when he was ready, George took the brick and he threw it in the river. So after that point, it almost like it became acceptable for fighters to acknowledge that, you know, the brain is a muscle too that needs to be worked out and, and, and trained. So I'm curious now, you seem like you're a very introspective man. Do you have anybody that helps you think about stuff like that? Or is it self-taught through books or just the people you surround yourself with? And uh, of course, the surrounding plays a, a huge part 
in it. And uh, to be to be introspective is to, to is the greatest gift you can give yourself. I think accountability is the greatest thing that <clears throat> I I realize when I hear someone near me say, "Oh, I lost it because of my coach." Oh, I lost it because of this. It's because it's always someone else other than them. Mm -hmm. But let's say George seeing the psychology. I think the way when he got to the point where he threw the brick, he he realized that. Uh, I think seeing a sport, I'm, I'm not a big fan of seeing a sport psychologist because I think it's most, most of their job is to make you realize that you have the power to make it better. Even though mm -hmm. you, you lost, you have the power to, to grow from it. Uh, I think that's what their job is. And I think uh, most of the time people need that when they lack a little bit of accountability. I think George, it was his first loss. No, he lost to Matt Hughes before. Yeah. So you were talking about the Sarah or the huge fight? Sarah, the, the Matt huge. Sarah. Sarah? Yeah, Matt Sarah. So the Sarah one, even now, he's be much more open about it. And back then, maybe it was a little bit less. But when it happened, he knew why it happened. He wasn't training. He took Max Sarah like he was uh, just a guy he would beat. Uh, he was never in the gym. Uh, all of his coaches were like, "Man, George, where are you?" He's like, "Nah, it's easy fight. Don't worry." And and he he faced the the harsh reality of of his choices. And I think that sort of, that's sport psychologist's job was to make him understand without being too brusque without being too uh intense to him but make him realize that loss is on you mm -hmm. and once you you know that you can create a better future for yourself you can also create a worse future for yourself so yeah so accountability what i like from it is it makes you learn that with your hands you can create uh something great and you can destroy something as well so knowing that Uh, we are in a very privileged place, uh, Americans and Canadians and uh, many people in the world. Like, we're not starving. So, sorry, I'm making a big circle, but let's come back to the... No, the, no, keep going. The question. Uh, one thing that I like is the fighting sport, you cannot be a fake fighter because mm -hmm. you will get exposed fast. Yeah. You can be a fake rapper. You can be a fake artist, a fake model. You can be a fake, fake anything. Yeah. Fighting world, you get exposed. And once you get exposed, if you're one of those guys who's like, oh, I need to change camp. Oh, I need to change coach. Oh, I need to change my diet. Oh, it was because of that. If you're not looking uh, inwards, you're never going to find uh, yeah. the solution to get stronger. Accountability is hard. The, I can read any article about myself, even like, let's say after the Paris loss, I read some very terrible article about myself. And I, I realized that, Man, I've been telling myself so much meaner and more intense stuff. I'm my biggest critique. I'm, uh, I'm very hard on myself, which makes me uh, less susceptible to fail, uh, fall into the trap of media saying, oh, he's not good. Oh, he's not George. Oh, he's not. I don't mind. I'm harder on myself than anybody can, can ever mm -hmm. be. So uh, critics, I don't pay too much attention to them because I'm my hardest critics and I'm very hard on myself. Let, let's take a point into consideration. I grew up with a proper family. Of course, we weren't rich. Uh, my, my, my mom and my father had four boys. So it was a very intense household. But all the hardship I've been facing throughout my life were self-inflicted in order to grow. And that's one thing. I, I could have been another, you know, construction worker playing hockey, uh, weekends with the boys, drink beer. Like, this is all my friends. This is all what they do. Uh, but I decided to go a different path. And a path that was uh, very intense. Tense, and I, I wouldn't be where I am today if it wasn't from the fact that I, I realized that growth come from hardships and like 18 year olds selling everything I had and leave to go to Thailand and fight there mm. and stuff like that. Like those were crazy thoughts, but I just felt like it was the right thing to do in order to grow as a man, because the more you grow as a man, the more proper you are to become a, a, a role model, let's say for my, my, my kids. Uh, in the future mm -hmm. and the students I will have in the future. So it's, it's very important for me to challenge myself in order to grow, which lead to me being a, well, maybe one day I can be a proper mentor for some people. So yeah, sorry for the big circle. No, no, no. Accountability and hardships are necessary in order to grow. It's really refreshing to hear you talk like that because uh, in today's world, it's, it's, it's not a, a view that's held by a lot of people. I think there's a movement sort of right now where it's a, whatever you want to call it, the man's movement or whatever, where 
men are sort of having to learn how to, or sorry, relearn how to act this way and sort of have this, this internal dialogue with themselves. And, and so it's important to see and hear people like you talk about it. So I appreciate it. Thank you. My pleasure. Just give a little example. Now we say men can be uh, emotional. Men mm -hmm. can uh, need to let their emotions out. I don't know if you saw recently the video of the judge who got uh, jumped by a man. Yeah, uh, I did. Super viral over the internet. Yeah. So this man was sentenced and he jumped over. That's a man acting on his emotion because emotions are not only good things. They are very intense things. And once you, you get a man who doesn't have control over his emotions and he, he's not stoic when something happened and he has no understanding, if he lets his emotions go, Mm -hmm. is, is, is uh, anger will turn into something very, very dangerous. And now we're teaching men that it's okay to be emotional, cry all the time, give a medal, even if you're last. Oh, obesity is beautiful. Like there, there's a lot of things that I'm like, please, like don't stop lying mm -hmm. to yourself because there's nothing harder than the punch of truth. If truth hit you in the face, it's going to be the hardest punch you'll ever get. Ever. So I, I, I don't know why this movement of giving medals to anybody, giving uh, 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 good grades, even though someone didn't do well, it's, it's important to challenge yourself. Like I, I have a, a friend who's a teacher and he said, no, do you know, I don't recall. Maybe you recall when you were younger, you, they, you had those little tests where you have a timer. And you need to fill in the most uh, multiplication, division yeah. stuff. And you have like two minutes and you need to do the most you can. And now in university, because my friend's in university and he told me, no, we cannot do this anymore because it's too much pressure for the kids. They're too mm -hmm. stressed. I mean, man, stress is one of the best hormones in order to grow because you're, you're, uh, you're under pressure. And I was like, man, I despise that. It's only written tests. Of course, maybe you're going, you're not, you're going to do bad. But at one point, the more and more you do it, the more you get accustomed to that pressure. And now it's not even pressure anymore. It's just yeah. a game. And uh, when I heard that, I was like, man, this is, this is, this is very dangerous. But hey, I'm not a teacher. I'm, a, I'm, I'm just a man. But I, I, I truly believe that hardships are necessary. And now we're living in a very comfortable world uh, where, like I said, give, give, give the big trophy to the last guy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Speaking of trophies, in the UFC and fighting, the trophies are represented by belts. You've uh, been progressing your way up the ranks for that for a while yes. now. And sorry, I'm going to be on a, a couple sort of similar uh, tangents at the same time. So you also talked about the media and how the media had some criticisms about you. But I don't really pay attention to the media per se. Like I know I'm technically part of the media. But when I go after an event, I'll go into the online forums. I'll read what the actual fans are, are saying. And one thing that's uh, invariable about, you know, the, the comments about your fight is that everyone loves how exciting you are and how slick is the word that's used often. Your, your striking is excellent. Your boxing is very good. Uh, your kicks, everything about you is good. And even, you know, with all that being said, you know, some people think of you as the striking guy. You have some great submissions, too. So you're just an excellent fighter. And it's when the, when the, when the, the, the fans watch you, they appreciate enjoying watching you fight. So that being said, with the win in Toronto in, in two weekends, yes. do you have any aspirations for a title run? Is that something that's ever been discussed with the UFC? Or how does that even work? Do you think you're on the right trajectory? So with a proper win uh, in two weeks, which uh, will put me in a 3-0 and contract, which is very good for me. And now I can embark into the next branch of, of uh, aiming towards that title. Because uh, if I finish this contract 3-0, then we're going to start talking about pay-per-view and a big increase in terms of salary. Because mm -hmm. when you look at the top 15, these guys are not only good fighters, they're very good at winning. And there's a big difference yeah. between yeah. The, uh, the, the two. Some guys are good to let's we fight. Like uh, there's a guy up and coming I really like to watch. is uh, Joao Anderson, the, the Brazilian yeah. guy. I think that's his name. Uh, there's Diego Lopez also who's knocking at the top 15. There's a lot of guys who are coming up uh, that are super impressive. But I think uh, these guys need to, and even myself, we need to take a little step back to understand the art of winning is very big when you once you reach top 15, top uh, uh, 10, top 5. These guys know how to win rounds. They look at the clock. They know 
how many punches they threw and they they analyze those things and if you make me fight let's say one of these guys i i would like to have a a big raise in terms of pay because i i it takes away from the the fun element uh, of the fight let's say my camp for cron gracie was so much difficult it was one of the hardest camp i've ever had mentally physically i was always with these crazy wrestlers these crazy jujitsu guys destroying me destroying me because uh, that that was necessary in order to to grow of yeah. course but that camp like i didn't throw a single kick during that camp and me i'm a kickboxer i'm a muay thai guy i like kicking taekwondo everything and i i that was more of a i wanted to win and that was a It was a good victory. I'm happy about it, but still, I was a little bit bitter that I couldn't. I, I was not allowed to throw my whole arsenal yeah. because I was there to win more fights, and so that's why when they gave me Ramos afterward, I was so happy. I'm like, wow, thank you very much. And now they gave me Woodson, and I'm like, wow, you're giving me a tall striker who, who, who will uh, try to rip my head off with kicks, knees, and punches. I'm I'm happy about those match. But if you tell me that, like, uh, let's say you're fighting. I don't have an example. Let, let's say Ige. Ige is a very game fighter, but he knows how to win as well. Mm -hmm. So this aspect of he's just waiting for me to throw that kick to take me down. So now I need to work on angles, stuff like that. So it, it takes away a little bit from the excitement of <coughs> cowboys shooting at each other in, in, in the middle of the octagon. But when it comes to the title, I have a big assignment this uh, in two weeks. And uh, this is what I'm focused fo uh, focused on. But of course, now being three and zero uh, and and aiming towards the 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 top 15, it's a uh, one step at a time. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, it would be a good step uh, after Toronto for sure. You just brought up the Cron Gracie fight when that fight was announced. Uh, Cron has sort of has a an, an aura of mystique around him. Of course, his his father Hickson Gracie, one of the greatest jujitsu players in in history, and you know people were just amazed that uh you know at, at, at him kind of sort of so when this fight was announced a lot of people automatically thought that he was going to win he was like the the second coming or the golden child and he'd win this fight hands down and i messaged fabio i said fabio this uh this fight with cron i mean how's charles going to train for that and fabio just smiled and he said uh yeah he's just not going to get taken down and that's what happened man you did, had a beautiful game plan so i hear you say the words that you're a little bit bitter but i don't think you know i'm not you but i don't know that you should be bitter man i mean You did what you had to do to win a fight. It was a smart fight, and it was not a boring fight. And there's a difference between sometimes fighters will, will not engage in order to win a fight or just to you know make it through a, a fight unscathed. But the way you did it, that's not what you did. You still fought. You just fought your fight. So I think it was a great fight. Okay, yeah, and I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Uh, one thing that I would like to add to that is the bitterness feeling is like going to war and knowing you have your AK-47, but you're still with that little pistol. So like I was using boxing in angles and I was like, <laughs> always like, should I kick, should I kick? And I can hear Fabio, don't kick, don't kick. Because, you know, he, he catching that kick, get down. And I'm like, uh. so the, that that was my point. I'm, I'm Uh, as a man, I'm very satisfied about the result because I'm uh, the only Canadian who has now beat a Gracie, which is which is very cool. I have uh, you know a great name on my resume as a as a legacy because I, I was so young. I was watching all those episodes of Cron online uh, about uh, there's like a Munchies interview. There's like so many stuff about him online, and I remember watching it him when he was fighting ADCC, beating all those guys yeah. and guillotine this guy. Boom, that guy. And I was like, wow. And then when they say, uh, oh, you're fighting Kron, I was like, huh, really? So that's good. So no, I, I, the bitterness was in the fact that I was like, I wanted to use stuff, but I stick to the plan. And at the end, I'm like, man, I had so much opening, especially in the third round. I knew he was tired and everything, but I stick to the game plan. So from that, I'm very proud of myself for, mm -hmm. for being able to not uh, get out of the, the, the proper way. But there was still that, like, a couple moments. I was like, man, I should kick, I should kick, I should go. Oh, okay, don't. So that the bitterness feeling came from, come, come, came from that. But uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm still very proud of that performance. As well you should be. So let's move from a, a past opponent to a future opponent. And Sean Woodson is your opponent at UC 297. Yeah. 
you mentioned that you're excited that you'd be facing a tall, a tall, tall striker. What is it about him? And when you're making a game plan for a fighter like that, does it mostly come from you or how much input do other people have into your game plan? Uh, my boxing coach has a tremendous impact on it. Uh, I've been training with him, Ian McKillop. Uh, he was a, a big champion, trained with Fedor Roach a uh, long time, uh, was a sparring partner with Shane Mosley, a very knowledgeable man when it comes to boxing. So uh, him, uh, he, he came up with a strategy. Then I have my my, my striking coach, uh, Son, one of my very good friends who's a Taekwondo world champion mm-hmm. as well, helping me with... Uh, other stuff and uh, then we have Fabio that we every time we go somewhere we watch some tapes I think it's the fighter that I've studied the most because he's very interesting because people say oh this guy he makes mistake there he makes mistake there but they're very hard mis- uh, they're very very hard to capital- capitalize mm-hmm. on so it's easy to watch a tape and say oh Woodson does this bad but it's hard to get to him because of the reach, because of his mobility, the way he punches. Like, he has a weird cadence to his punches. He's like, pop, 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 pop. So those are like, maybe, I, I don't know, I've never been hit by him, but those are like are some shots that make your brain vibrates a lot because they're not like, boom, chin, you go down. He doesn't have many knockouts except one with Terrence McKinney with the knees. But he has uh, pressure, like, pow, 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 pow. He pushes you, and every time he hits, he looks heavy because of his height and he knows how to fall into yeah. his punches. Uh, there was a very interesting fight with Saldana, but Saldana, I don't know what he has in between his brain. It was such a weird performance from him. And uh, that was that was very weird. He knocked him down twice, the illegal knee. Woodson is very durable that you can see that he came back from that. And then we have the most recent fight with Bajushka, I think his name is... Uh, Bajushka was winning some of these striking exchange and then decided to plunge into takedown and, and empty this gas tank with it. So we have a lot of fights to watch. He has a lot of fight to watch for myself. One thing that I can take away from him that I think I have more is how much I get better in the, after each fight. And I think him, he's staying a little bit mm. the same without having too much of his arsenal. Like he's still a tall boxer, a good calf kicks. Those are very dangerous. Uh, but I think I think he's going to fight a little bit different with me because he's not afraid of takedowns, but it's MMA, and he should be concerned that uh, there, there, there's always a possibility. Of course, the, the possibility is less high when you watch my tapes, but I, I'm, getting, I'm improving a lot in every mm-hmm. aspect of uh, martial art, uh, especially having a guy like Matteo Vogel who's, who's fighting the, on the 19th yeah. right before. We're going to war together, and he's a very capable, uh, uh, capable uh, wrestler and and uh, jujitsu guy. And the exchange we would have, people would be like, "Man, Charles is supposed to be a striker," and then you can see that uh, it's it's those, those rounds. I think uh, at some point we should be filming some because our our rounds are very incredible. And me, I'm helping him tremendously with the striking aspect. Matteo can surprise me with kicks, calf mm-hmm. move, and everything. So. Me and him are, are really pushing each other to get better into things that uh, we need to work on. So that being said, I think um, I, I, I will look out at how Woodson move. And now just by his movement, his torso is, is the way he carries himself. I will be able to know if he's underestimating the fact that I can take him down and submit him and, and uh, do proper damage on top. But only the only during the fight uh, I will tell. I'm a field fighter, and once I feel something, uh, I trust my gut, and uh, it led me to the biggest organization in the world. So I'll, I'll mm-hmm. still do that. Something else that you didn't mention is that you're going to be fighting in, in in a hometown crowd, essentially in, in Canada with a Canadian crowd. Now it's going to be huge. Like every yeah. time I've attended a UFC event in Canada, when a Canadian fighter fights, you can't you can't hear anything. Have you prepared for that at all, or you're just waiting for it to like whack you upside the head? It's hard to prepare for something that you've never uh, uh, that you have never felt. I fought at the Bell Center for yeah. TKO, which was uh, probably like half the people that was going that that is going to be at the Scotia Bank Arena, uh, which led to the fact that I'm not I cannot say I'm prepared because I've never faced it, but. I, I, when it comes to performance, let's say there was a big crowd also at UFC 288 when I first, I faced Kwon Gracie. 
And when I won, people were happy and everything. It was good, but I need to make sure the thirst for blood of the fan does it get yeah. through my head and I make bad decisions yeah. in the fight. I need to be logic. I need to attack what I need to. And once the finish is there, I'll be able to take my first breed of mission accomplished. And then we'll see with the fans. And I, of course, sharing this moment with them will, uh, will be a, a moment like a souvenir that I'll get all of my life. Yeah. But uh, it could be also the worst night of my life. I'm not cautious. So I need to be very careful with that. So my, my, I need to stay very methodic and make sure I take him out uh, with, the, 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 with everything we've been yeah, working for on. Sure. Well, Charles, I, I've met you before and, and chatted with you briefly in person, but this is the first time I've had a chance to interview you. Uh, almost what I expected. You're, you're very introspective. You're very thoughtful, very intelligent, and, of course, excellent fighter. So I, I'm sure everybody watching here on MMA, which is Canada's biggest and best mixed martial arts website, uh, we thank you for your time, and we're all going to be watching UC 297 from Toronto, and we wish you the best of luck. Thank you very much for your time. I'm very appreciative and I really like those questions. Those are fun questions that uh, makes you think. And uh, these are the interviews that I really enjoy. And uh, I'll make a little shout out, of by the way. Uh, if you guys are watching this and you're not following him and hey, I'll kick your ass. <laughs> <laughs> he said it, not me, everybody. Thank you for your time. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Charles. I truly <laughs> appreciate it. Best of luck.